The following is an analysis, interpretation, and summary of James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. Chapter 7. The Secret to Self-Control. So in the last video, Chapter 6 of Atomic Habits, we talked about how to design an environment so you can be most successful and productive and constructive in this world. Even amidst a, such a destructive environment, how can you create your own little cocoon of positivity, of constructiveness, where you can be just a little bit better for yourself and get out of the chaos and hell that you might be going through. Really one of my favorite recent chapters. Now, chapter seven, this idea of self-control. People feel like they have to exert a lot of discipline and willpower in this life. And managing addictions um, amongst all of that, that can be very difficult. How can we make that easier for ourselves? So to dive stri straight in, addictions can dissolve if there is radical change in environment. It's what we talked about last week and how important environmental design is and how you can actually manipulate your environment to be better for you. Well, how do we manage addictions now? It can be quite a tricky psychophysiological uh, intertwinings that can be difficult to unpack. Well, this, one of the steps we need to look at is our environment. Example, in Vietnam, US soldiers were constantly surrounded by cues triggering heroin use. Once the soldier returned home, they found themselves in an environment devoid of all those triggers. The context changed, and so did the habit. Another example. In comparison, typically 90% of heroin users become re-addicted once they return home from rehab because their environment didn't change and they weren't taught the strategies to cope with handling the old cues and cravings. I have, I have seen this firsthand myself with uh, drug use and addictions uh, in people and rehabilitation homes being so useful for a lot of people to uh, detox quote unquote from the destructive environment but the destructive drug that is maybe destroying their life relationships and health okay and the one thing that rings so true is that if nothing changes, nothing changes. You didn't fix the root cause of the problem by moving away from it. You just, you almost put a bit of a band-aid on it. You just kind of tricked yourself into, oh, things are okay now. But if you go back into that same environment, let's say your home environment, your social group, is one that is very triggering for destructive habits, whatever it may be. It could be addictions like drugs, it could be anything. You go back into that environment, even after a little bit of a multi-month hiatus where you've been really good to, and you're really good to yourself, you've noticed all these ha uh, habits improve. Wow, I feel great. Emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically. You go back into that environment, relapse is a high likelihood just a matter of time because those cues in your environment are still there triggering you. And you, one only has so much willpower and discipline to exert over themselves to constantly manage the environment that is triggering their relapse type behavior or addictive type behavior. You might be good the first, the second, the third time with a cue. All right, breathe, all right. I know it's just a bit of a, a lot of things is stress for people. Like stress can be a big trigger for people, but you haven't changed your environment to actually uh be less stressful, nor have you developed the tools and resources to manage stress when you go in stressful environments. So, all right, you try your best. All right, breathe, just do your thing. All right, second time. All right, God damn it, this is really annoying me. Third time, ah, fuck it. Screw it. I'm just going to, you go out, you snap. You're back to smoking. You're back to drugs. You're back to sex addiction. You're back to whatever addiction, poor behavior, poor eating that you previously tried to address but you tried but you, you worked hard but you didn't work smart and this is the thing with rehab homes and you know some do great jobs with them and some do not some do not actually give people the tools and resources great you talk therapy you have your environment where you're you're not allowed to do certain behaviors you're, you're very structured and regulated there are clear consequences to uh, transgressing uh, and uh it's not the re it's not a reflection of the real world. It's like it's like high school or primary school or you know school is not a reflection of the normal workplace behavior generally speaking um, and real day to day life. 
And so you're not actually preparing the individual to handle the day-to-day stresses of life. They're not equipped with the tools. They don't know how the strategies, they don't know how to design the environment. In fact, if every rehab home came with a book of Atomic Habits by James Clear and actually, or, or like they got to watch a video series like this that, that talk through all these concepts, hmm, I wonder. I really, I really do wonder. They went through the strategies, they went through the, 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 the different concepts in this book, they put them into practice. Like, what if we had just worked smarter? Like you're trying to abstain so hard with discipline and effort not to do the thing you want to do. What if you just change your environment? What if you just move all the food that's in the fridge and cupboard triggering that behavior instead of it out being on the counter, you put it in the garage or you give it, you know, for example, like maybe you're, maybe you just can't stop watching TV. Like I actually thought about this one time. It's like, hmm, if that habit ever, cause I, I really enjoy uh, entertainment. I enjoy a great movie or a, or a television show or a great book. Right. But let's talk about something that's more stigmatized. You know, it's not usually, ad, it's more admirable to read than it is to watch Rick and Morty. Right. I love Rick and Morty. Okay. It's actually quite intellectually stimulating to me as well because they, it's not just colorful moving images that are, you know, superficially stimulating to you. It actually, a really good uh, piece of entertainment is a cerebral experience. It makes you think. It makes you question reality. It, it, it challenges your preconceptions and biases. And these are the things that I gravitate towards. It's not just trying to be like, sometimes you want mindless things to just detach from reality. But you want to implant yourself in another universe. This is how I justify it to myself because, you know, to be honest, sometimes I have friction against doing these things. I'm like, hmm, am I wasting time? But I'm like, hmm, what am I on this planet to do? Just to work all the time? No, I'm not on this planet to just work all the time. It's not, I'm not just a slave to productivity and ambition. I'm also here to laugh and smile and enjoy some ridiculousness from now and then. So I do that. And I can't remember the point I'm trying to make. We're talking about environmental design. Oh, the TV. So if that got too far, like, because a lot of people, let's say you're in a situation where you're like, "Um, I'm I'm a little bit getting addicted to this. I'm doing too much of this behavior. It's distracting me from my work too much. All right. I thought about, hmm, I take the, how would I manage that? I take the cable. I can't turn it on without a cable, right? And I give the cable to someone else for the day and they leave the house. And then that's it. I can't turn the TV on. Until the cable comes back, which is not in the house because it's with the other person who's traveling. So it's impossible to get back, impossible to turn on the TV. You could do that for a, for a computer, for video games or a video game console. You could do that with anything. So I'm like, how can you design an environment to work? Okay, so maybe you got, you, you got your, uh, hmm, what else? Your cigarette packet. No, your keys to your car. Because your keys to your car, you're gonna go to the shops to get the cigarette even if you take the cigarette packet away from you, right? You got the keys, you got, but if you're far away, are you gonna really gonna walk 20 minutes? Like that's a, it's like a big thing you have to overcome. You got 20 minutes of walking, thinking about what the hell am I doing? Walking all the way to the shops just to get a cigarette packet. It's a big thing to overcome. You really have to have a huge, pretty, pretty large addiction and drive to stimulate you to get to there, to the shops to get the cigarette packet, right? And if, if you really walk 20, 30 minutes to get the cigarette packet after I take the keys away from you, we're probably dealing with some bigger problems, <laughs> to be honest, right? So, Rehab homes, environmental design, people think it's just about self-control and discipline, but I used to th- I used to think so too, man. I used to think so too, but it's like the trick we play on ourselves throughout the world we live in. It's like work harder, just like more, 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 sleep less, work harder, more reps, more sets. What? What if I just, what if I just take the, the plug, the plug away. What if I just walk on the outskirts of the grocery store instead of going inside? Where are the sugar? Where are the like calorically dense processed food is? What if I just, I don't know, like turn off my phone when I sleep, or I get a separate phone, one for social media and one for work, and I put the social media phone in a cupboard away from me, like. Now I don't have to like work really hard to be like, ah, put it down. Ah, I'm using it too much. That sounds smarter to me. So people think it's just about self-control and discipline. And that's the only part of the problem that you should address. And this idea is deeply embedded in our society. And to an extent, it's definitely true. 
right? Like, yes, discipline, self-control. It's like, it's a weakness for a lot of people. And a lot of people do need to be more disciplined. 100%. A lot of people are weak, mentally, physically. You just need to be more goddamn disciplined. But it's part of the problem. And saying someone to be more motivated or disciplined is not actually going to help them. You need to develop a structure and environment so they can exert those behaviors. Hello, welcome environment again. Environmental design. It's not just about working harder. It's about working smarter. Designing an environment to work for you instead of against you. So people say all the time, not all the time, I'll go gas myself up that much. I have heard many a time people talk like they reference me to be ambitious or disciplined. Um, and they, it's a trait they admire within me. You know, you have to have some mo- some moniker of discipline and ambition to spend hundreds of hours essentially dissecting books. You have to have something pushing you to come here every single week because I tell you, right, when I got up... <laughs> Think about doing 48 videos of the 48 Laws of Power. At some point, it gets a little bit monotonous. At some point, you're like, damn, man, I'm on 35. Oh, I've got like 13 more to go. Like, this is going to take a while, right? You you want to do it. It's helping you. But now you've committed to it. And, you know, uh, what do they call this? Uh, sunk cost fallacy. You've, you've invested so much. You can't get out now. And so, yes, discipline and ambition, yes, they, they need to exert themselves. But there's something else there. It's like a commitment. It's an identity. It's like, are you the type of person that doesn't just give up? Like there has to be some, what's the threshold for you before you stop and give up on something? You know, what type of person do you want to be? So that's that's more like, I don't exert discipline. Like people think you need rest days um, and like, between the uh, exercise and uh, I I won't dive into the physiological reasons um, and the science of why you can get away with no rest days uh, because that's for strength of sad. But for now, like um, I don't do that. I don't have rest days. I do something physically uncomfortable, discom- structured f- uh, exercise every single day. Okay, I have for, I won't even say how long. Okay, it doesn't matter. But and people think it's like, oh, that must require so much discipline. You must be so motivated to do that. No, I'm not at all. I don't exert discipline or motivation, like almost at all. I'm not going to say at all, but like it's almost negligible. Okay. I have habits. I have a routine. I have a structure. I have systems. I have an environment that is promoting to the habits that I want. And even more importantly, I have a foundation of character traits and identity uh, that is really entwined with those habits that I exhibit. If you're the type of person that doesn't miss days, then why would you miss a day? Because that would be incongruent with who you are and who you want to become. And that's an identity conflict that can cause all types of havoc internally. And so to manage that havoc, I don't miss days. But I can see, you can see also you can get yourself in a bit of trouble because in being like a robot of like, oh, I must train every single day forever. No, I recognize at the same time that the identity you have has to be malleable and adaptable and your discipline and your habits can have room. Like at some point, like I'm probably not going to, I'm probably going to have a day where I don't exercise and train in the next like decade. It's probably going to happen. And I'm not gonna, <laughs> and it's probably not worth having an identity crisis over that, right? Like some people who like their plant-based diet or carnivore-based diet, and they have a bit of meat or they have a bit of plants, and they lose their mind, and they have an identity crisis, and they don't know who they are anymore, and they cry and they get emotional. It's like it's okay. You you know you don't have to do the same. You don't have to do what you say. You can change your mind. And so there's room for that adaptability. So, just an example, like I don't have to exert any type of heroic willpower or discipline to do the things that I do, right? Almost never, right? Because I develop systems and habits and environment and a, like a quite a clinical self-reflective, self-reflective, um, well, I've done self-reflective analyses on myself where I know who I am and I know in where is where I don't know who I am and I'm still figuring that out. And that helps me form an identity that where I can establish habits that are constructive for me. Like, 
Like if you don't want to slip, don't go where it's slippery. And so it becomes easier to exert a lot of these habits when you, like if, it's very easy for me because like I, I have like a pretty structured sleep re- regimen. Like I don't remember the last time I went to bed past midnight voluntarily, voluntarily, you know. Um, so, you know, you could say like, oh, you're so structured and regimented and like, but I don't put myself in like, like, man, I wish I could do that. Maybe like you're struggling with your sleep yourself or you're struggling with food or whatever it is you're struggling with. It's like, think about where, you have, where you're putting yourselves in situations where you could slip. If you don't want to slip, don't go where it's slippery. I think I heard that from Tim on Tim Ferriss' podcast in reference to drugs because like if you're going out to party every week, you're, what's associated with partying? Alcohol, drugs, women, men, sex, and a pretty lousy night's sleep, sleep deprivation, which can tie into multiple days of like binge eating and just like pretty pretty shitty feeling. And just like like a quarter or well, third of your week is just like feeling pretty lousy. You know, I have no interest in spending a quarter or a third of my weeks uh, feeling that way. I like to feel good. People ask me why I don't drink. Uh, I say because I like to feel good. <laughs> And it's a bit of like a tongue in cheek and like a bit of a bit of an asshole response. And like, it doesn't do, like, I don't know. Why don't you, uh, why don't you, uh, I don't want to say that. Um, I don't know. Why don't you eat donuts for every meal or donuts every day? It's like, you know, I like to feel good and be healthy and I like to get good sleep and I don't know. It doesn't, it, there's no, it's no issue. It's not, I don't feel like I'm losing anything by abstaining or not doing the thing that a lot of people do, okay? A lot of people get like uh, fear of missing out. And it's like, I don't feel that uh, in that way anyway. Um, anyway, we're getting on some tangents, which I do enjoy. That's why these are commentary and analysis and uh, not just reading the audiobook that's why this stuff is very different from like if you just to read the book yourself because you you don't get this business anyway so when we talk about self-control addictions managing behavior if people got taught how to manage your environment let's continue from there so disciplined people are better at structuring their lives in a way that does not require heroic willpower and self-control they spend less time in tempting situations i spend less time in situations that tempt me with poor decisions think about how you or someone you know could spend less time, or maybe they're spending a lot of time in tempting situations. So the people with the best self-control are typically the ones who need to use it the least. It's easy to practice self-restraint when you don't have to use it very often. And so that's why it's a tool that I can like pull out of my pocket anytime. Like I'm good. Like, cause I have like so much reserve of self-control and willpower usually um, that it's easier abstain to abstain from like the cake that's sitting right in front of me that would probably spill me over in calories and fat content for the day. Or I don't know. It's not it's very it's not even a thought for me to abstain and restrain I don't have to restrain myself from alcohol, but I understand people may. Um, and so we have to think of replacement behaviors. So, you know, a lot of people feel awkward if they don't have a drink in their hand. It's like, okay, let's replace that drink with just have something in your hand. Let's go uh, a sparkling water or, or like a like a iced tea type of uh, drink that looks like you're drinking. No one's going to really think. You could lie to people and say you're drinking X, Y, Z if you really want. But like this is how we can manage some of these social ramifications um, to that. So think about like how can you design a life where you don't have to exert a lot of self-restraint, a lot of self-control. And that comes about designing an environment and a circle of people. We say like physical environment, but we're also talking about a circle of people. Like the, you are the average of the people you associate with. And we do not just mean in person. We mean also from like social media, from who you're listening to, who you're watching. Like how, like for some people, all they listen to is like uplifting, constructive, productive, like podcasts and videos like this. That's just like all they listen to. Like that's what previously I did. I don't listen to anything right now, but previously that's what I did, right? So I was just getting fed inspiration and education on a daily basis, but I was becoming obese in knowledge. But that was, that's another, that's another topic. But, you know, I was, it was good in a way because, you know, I was just getting fed like positivity. So like if your environment's chaotic, put the headphones in, just go into a different environment and world. It's like, 
all right, now your friend's Joe Rogan. Now your friend's like, uh, I don't know, who else? Any influential artist or entertainer or, or, or author, or like anybody that you admire, athletes, like anybody that you enjoy and listen, like you can listen to and observe and learn from and you become, you assimilate some of their character traits and you assimilate some of their ideas into your own. And now you don't have to exert as much willpower and effort over life because you're upgrading your own operating system through not only improving your physical environment, but improving your social environment. I really like that concept of it's like, how can we upgrade my and our operating system? It's like Windows, Mac, like whatever, but you all have an operating system. How can we refine it, upgrade it, adapt it? You know, it's easier to avoid temptation than resist it. So how can you just design an environment where you just don't have the temptation to begin with? If the cake never comes home or the donut never comes home, you never have to resist not eating it. If you never go out, or not never, if you don't go out, then why would you have to resist drinking? Why would you have to resist staying up late or any behavior that you don't want to do? It's not visible. You want to make it invisible. So once the habit has been encoded, the urge to act follows whenever the environmental cue reappears. We know this. Um, this is what we're talking about. The person gets home from the rehab home. They come home. The habit's encoded. They haven't changed the roots of the habit. The urge to act follows when the cue is triggered. And this is, we see this biggest loser, right? Everyone who knows that show, most people do. The contestants, all of them almost rebound. There's, they've done research on this. Rebound once they get home within about a year, I believe. If not, weighing heavier. Because it's not a rest. And like, as a coach myself, like this really strikes a chord with me because we're not actually addressing the root cause of what got them to the obesity, the unhealthiness, the poor lifestyle decision-making in the first place. Now, what you do have is like a boot camp. You have an environment where you, you're taking them through like buds for like, you know, weight loss. And cool. They're going to kill it. They're going to kill themselves. And they're going to learn some things about themselves. They're going to learn discipline. They're going to learn willpower. They're going to learn that they're going to have a lot more capable in the tank uh, from like a psychological perspective than they once knew. I'm not saying there's not benefits. But, and maybe I'm not aware of it, but to my understanding, they're not actually establishing routines and habits and the ability for the contestants to gain a better control over themselves to, hey, Okay, so tell me about how did we get here? Let's go back. I want you to think about a time where you were at your best health. What did that look like? Who were you? Where were you? What type of people around you? What were you feeling? What were you doing? Right? These are questions I ask clients of mine, right? Because now I'm like, there are clues in success. You've been successful before. You haven't been overweight or obese or unhealthy your whole life, right? You haven't been addicted and sick your whole life. You haven't been. At some point in your life, because everyone's like at some point in your life, you, even if it's early on, childhood, right? Let's talk about that. What were you doing well then? All right, great. Because that gives us clues in how we can create better cues in our environment and better environment to be more successful. To continue, there's this term James uses called cue induced wanting. And this is the term that's like bad habits are autocatalytic. The process feeds itself. You feel down, you eat junk food. Because you eat junk food, you feel bad. I don't even like, sorry, I don't even like using the word junk food. I don't like applying morality to food. It's just the term in the book. But the point is, it's like a cycle, like emotion, response, emotional, uh, like uh, turmoil, like addictive, addictive response. You know, and maybe like, oh man, you watch a movie, you sit down, you, you watch, you get home from work, you watch t TV like for an hour or two, and I, like you eat some some ice cream and some like you know hypoglycemic foods, and then you just you feel drowsy, you feel tired, right? It makes you feel sluggish, so you watch more TV because you don't have the energy to do anything else, and you repeat, and then four hours go by, and now you're asleep, right? Cue induced wanting. 
bad habits are autocatalytic. So you need pattern interrupts and foresight to not put yourself in those environments. Talked about that previously. Now I'll say it again, I've mentioned this before in the previous chapters, but sticking to positive habits in a negative environment is fighting an uphill battle. I've, I know this, I've done this throughout my life, it's difficult. And I know what it's like to then be in a much more positive environment where you're in control of all the variables. So what I could say is I encourage people to like, do your best to control the variables. Maybe you, maybe you live with parents, maybe you live at home with other people, you know, maybe you're just dealing with the situation that is not ideal. Well, do your best to control, to create an environment in an environment. Like I've said before, creating the bedroom as your sanctuary. Maybe the house is out of your control, but maybe, maybe your bed is in your control. Control that. Control what you can control. And people are like, how do I stop my bad habits? How do I, how do I change my habits? I'm just, I'm just, I just can't change my habits. It's just so hard. Oh, why is everything so? Like people, it's like they get in these mental ruts. Well, one of the best ways to change a bad habit is to reduce exposure to the cue that is triggering the bad habit. How do you do that? You make the cue invisible. So if you continually feel inadequate and jealous and envious by following people on social media and scrolling through your social media feed, stop following social media accounts that trigger jealousy and envy. This was me. It's not random why I don't follow anybody currently on my personal Alexander Emanuel uh, Instagram. It's because I was noticing that. I was becoming more neurotic. I didn't, I didn't feel better after looking at it almost always. Now, it, it's, it hinders me in other ways because I don't know what's going on with some of my personal friends and family or peers. And, you know, I don't know what's going on in popular culture as much. And you can be a bit more disconnected to like modern uh, news and just social political world events, which, which I recognize are important to be aware of as well. You don't want to be so reclused and disconnected. But at the same time, I, was, I don't want to feel bad. Like, I want to feel better, not worse. So I'm going to stop doing the thing that's making me feel worse, right? It's very like black and white in that way. But it's it, at some point, like how many years do you want to f like you got to stop and be like, Ugh, do I feel better? Just stop. Just stop doing the thing, right? And just see, give it a couple of days, give it a week. No one's, no one's forcing you to do it forever. Uh, uh, no one's forcing me to follow zero people. I can go back to following people anytime I want. And then I can get that little like fix and like, you know, look at people that I admire. I can do that anytime. But I like, and people like feeling good. They like, and so why wouldn't you want to keep doing that? You know, I don't think life is about, um, I don't think life is about feeling good and being happy, but I also don't think it's about like doing the opposite and feeling like bad and, and constantly like fighting emotion. So reduce exposure to the cue that causes it. We all have habits that we want to eliminate and reduce. So look at the goddamn cues and reduce them or eliminate them. Because you're going to exert self-control, but it's a short-term strategy. It's a band-aid. It's not a long-term one. Relying on self-control to overcome your desires and cravings is always fighting an uphill battle. It takes so much cognitive resources and willpower that can exhaust someone over the long term. Instead of fighting a craving triggered by the cue, just remove the cue entirely. That's where you can spend your energy instead to optimize your environment, to remove the cue, to manage the cue. So the secret to self-control is make the cues of your good habits obvious and the cues of your destructive habits invisible. One more time. Secret to self-control. Make the cues of the good habits obvious and in reach. And make the, the, the habits that are destructive that you don't want to do as much, make them invisible. Put the phone away. You put the food away. You... The good habit. You put the book in the bed. You keep the running shoes next to, you, next, to your, next to your bedroom door. There are so many examples. I won't sit here and just belabor them with unlimited ones. But make 
Good habits obvious make bad habits invisible. That's it. Done. Now, go design an environment that, where you can be more successful. That's it. Stop watching more videos. You don't need more videos. You're done. I'm going to keep doing these. So the next, the next video is chapter eight, how to make the habit irresistible. And that's on law two, make it attractive. But you don't need that one right now. You're good. And this is counterintuitive. Like, yeah, I'm just, I, sh I should be telling you watch more of my stuff, right? No, don't. Stop. Go do the thing. Go now design an environment where you're around now. Look around your environment right now and see how you can improve it. See how you, excuse me, see how you can design the environment around you to be more constructive to who you want to be, what you want to become, and the habits you want to do more of, and the habits you want to do less of. Go do it now. I'll be here. You can come back. For those still here, all podcasts, I put all these up on all podcast platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, at Alexander Emanuel. We are... We'll do chapter eight next week. How many chapters are there? 26, I believe. Sorry, 26, 20. There are 20 chapters and a conclusion. So you can expect me to cover all of these, just like I've covered all the 48 Laws of Power, 12 Rules for Life, How to Influence and Influence People, and most likely by now, if not soon, Sapiens. <sighs> Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next one.